Hello, I'm Mally Chance Fell, Managing Editor of Orthodontic Practice US, a Medmark publication. Welcome to a live presentation and question and answer with Dr. Neil Warshawski. Adult orthodontic patients define themselves mainly through aesthetic needs in the visible anterior region and less through functional requirements. This also means that the patient's expectations are increasingly similar to those of a consumer. As a result, time has become an important commodity in our society, which orthodontists can no longer ignore in their professional efforts. Exceldent enables Dr. Warshawski to treat all kinds of com complex situations in his aligner cases without compromises in biomechanics and predictability in tooth movement. His patients change aligners every seven days, although in some cases even faster, while achieving very predictable outcomes. We will be exploring this and more in our presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to invite viewers to use the question box in your control panel to ask any questions that you have, and your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Dr. Neil Warshawski has received his Doctor of Dental Surgery, Master of Science, and Certificate of Orthodontics from the University of Illinois at Chicago. As a board-certified orthodontic specialist, he has over 18 years of experience with cleft palate and craniofacial cases and is an assistant professor of surgery at the University of Illinois Craniofacial Center. A strong proponent of customized orthodontic solutions, Dr. Warshawski has been using the Invisalign system since 1999. He has authored over 25 articles on topics from Essex retainers to lingual orthodontics with orthognastic surgery. He's triple boarded as well as a member of American Board of Orthodontics. He routinely lectures to academics as well as professional crowds around the world on orthodontic efficiency and management. Dr. Warshawski, we turn the webinar over to you and welcome you to learn more about the topic for today. Great. Thanks, Melly. Okay, so I'm going to turn off my webcam so you guys can see us better and uh, we'll, we'll get started. So again, my name is Neil Warshawski. I'm an orthodontist here in the Chicagoland area. I'm north and south of the downtown area. I uh, work part-time at the University of Illinois in the Craniofacial Center and um, uh, just do a lot of orthodontics in general. So I thought today would be a kind of a fun thing to look at. Hang on, my, my presentation seems to be locked up. Let's try it again. Here we go. So a little bit about myself, as, you, as I'm telling you, is I'm from the University of Illinois. Uh, I, I did the thing you're not supposed to do. I started my practice from scratch back in 1992. Uh, I've survived to talk about it. We've done it several times now. We have four offices. Don't necessarily recommend four offices, but hey, you know, this is where my world is. So anyways, uh, I have a pretty interesting practice. We have a kind of a custom based concept where I believe everybody should get what they need, not make every appliance, you know, not make everybody fit the same appliance. So when we talk about uh, the consumer today, I think it's really interesting to understand what is driving the consumer. You know, people are really educated now and they're, they're really, they're shopping, you know, they're getting on the internet, they're, they're, they're learning about stuff, they're talking to friends, they're seeing ads, they're being swayed by uh, direct-to-consumer models, uh, and there's a lot of competition, whether it's a general dentist or an orthodontist or um, a DSO or uh, a company like, you know, Candid and Smile Direct, you know, and, and the issue is, as a, as a provider of care, you're afraid you're going to lose the patient, so you you start to do stuff that you wouldn't necessarily want to do, but it, you're afraid you're going to lose your patient. So as a result of that, you start to kind of sell your soul a little bit and give them stuff that wouldn't make a lot of sense normally. So so my concern is that you're going to do something, give somebody something that it doesn't make sense to you, but you're afraid that they're going to walk out the door and go down the street. Do you know that? Something that's changed since I've started treatment is people like don't want to be in treatment for two years. Like it used to be like everybody had two years of orthodontic care, but now suddenly they're like, well, my dentist said, or my friend said, or I heard from Smile Direct, or I've got a thing on my phone showing that I could be done in four months or six months. So this this whole thing about shortening the, the length of time on treatment is really, uh, it's appealing to the consumer. So, so we had to learn to figure out how do we make our model, our, our physical practice model work with this. So we started looking really at patient aspirations. And when you, when you talk about a patient, patients are defined by five things. They're defined by um, what they want in terms of speed, looks, 
lifestyle, cost, and comfort. So the thing that is really kind of sexy, I think, is the concept of speed because what I learned is when you offer people customized mechanics, things go faster. So, you know, it's kind of funny. We're in a very digital world where, you know, it's like, hey, you know, you just, you think you can just ask for it and get it, but you have to plan for it. So we learned that when we're trying to speed up the ultimate result of a case, we have a spectrum from easy to hard, um, from bloody to non-bloody, if you will, from cheap to expensive, you know, where you can have Wolkadonic surgery on one spectrum, and then we have like the uh, Optima from Excelident on the other end, which is just a simple device that vibrates and you bite on. And I found that patients that are interested in speed, but don't want to go all in, like, you know, have have periodontal surgery or a bone graft or, or uh, whatever, you know, TADS, you know. So so Excelident just kind of fit my model because it was it was kind of appealing and it was only a matter of money. And, and I'm going to tell you something you may not agree with, but but I do in my practice, which is I sell my Excelident at a loss. Like I actually sell it for less than I buy it for. And the reason why I do that is because for me, I win if my case finishes ahead of schedule. So if I don't take 18 months, I can be done in 12 months or eight months or nine months, I still get the same fee. I get the majority of the cost of my Excel event recovered, but I'm willing to lose a little bit. And for me, it's, it's, it's worked out pretty well. We've been doing this for, I don't know, a long time, like six, seven years at least. And, um, you know, I'll show you that I don't think this is a fad or a gimmick, but I'm going to tell you two more things that are just kind of golden rules. The first rule is if you don't believe in something, it's not going to work. So there's a lot of people that poo-poo uh, soft pulse vibration and stuff like that. And the thing that I'm going to tell you is, is if you don't believe in it, I don't care. I believe in it. My staff believes in it. We've got the cases to show. And as a result of that, we make our patient believe in it. So it's just what we do. But if you don't believe in it and you kind of show in your face when you're talking to them that this may work, it's not going to work. The other thing I'll say is that if you don't charge for the device, like if you build it into the cost of the case, the patient doesn't really see the cost and therefore they don't really have a value for it. So we actually separate the cost of the Accelerant device, even though it's one fee, we show them what they're paying we show them where we're losing our money. And I tell my patient, flat out, I'm investing in you. If I give you this discount, I'm actually losing money. And I'm going to do it because I want to make you happy. And if I get you done ahead of schedule, I know I'm going to make you happy. And you're going to owe me a social media review. And that's what I tell them. And it's really all very friendly. So <clears throat> sorry about the coughing. I'm just getting over pneumonia. Um, if you look at you know the history of like the articles that are out there I think what you'll find out is and you can go on the Excelident website to see these full articles in full is there's a lot of really interesting stuff that started back in the 70s and this piezoelectric study was one of the first thing that actually showed that um, there is electrical conduction that's being done by um, it's causing tooth movement to occur if you will and because of that um, when there is a charge done on the bone that you actually see tooth movement. So this was a study that was done back in the 70s. So this is uh, from Sh uh, Shapiro's study. It's kind of a classic study you can see. And it's really, it's, it's, it's really, it's a pretty solid study that shows, you know, that uh, as we all know that, you know, your body has electrical charges and stuff. But what we didn't understand at the time is, is it was associated with tooth movement. Down in... Uh, at the UT campus in uh, Houston, there was a double-blinded study done that was published around 15, which uh, kind of replicated some of the stuff that was done at the NYU study as well, and uh, also showed that um, when you when you measured um, mechanical movement of, of teeth using soft pulse vibration versus not using vibration, you saw, depending on which tooth you were studying, up to 50% faster tooth movement. So again, these studies are all on the web. I'm not gonna really go much more into the studies other than to say uh, there are a lot of studies to talk about all kinds of acceleration, uh, and you can see many of them on this uh, Accelident website. 
So if you break it down into millimeters per week, it's the teeth were moving almost a quarter millimeter per week when you were using an accelerant, which is kind of interesting. So as a result of that, you know, what I tell people is, is you have the ability to not only go faster, but the other thing that the study showed was that there was less pain. So, so there's two things. Remember, I talked about looks, comfort, speed, cost, and lifestyle. So comfort, meaning pain, and speed are, are two things that patients ask for us uh, quite a bit. So as a result of that, the Accelerant works for both of those. And we suggest for people, if they have a low tolerance for pain, that they consider this. The goal for me is for my patient to have uh, an experience that's better than what they expected. Not a good experience, a better experience. So if I finish faster, they are more comfortable. If they are cosmetically pleased with their results and they see it while they're in treatment, they gain something that I refer to as blind faith. And this blind faith is important to me because it's what makes people believe that I'm, uh, that I'm in control. So when we look at Excelident in general, you know, we, I break it down into three levels. There's a biological performance level, there's a mechanical performance level, and then lastly, there is a patient performance level. So, you know, when, when we're talking about aligner therapy, which is kind of the specific point to this webinar for the most part, um, what I tell people is it's just basically going to make the aligner stay on track better. And what's interesting is, is I'm not a big believer in pushing bad plastic. And I, I'm a very much a believer that uh, to optimize stuff, you, you should really constantly look at something and evaluate your situation and say, is this working? Do we need to change this? If you can do this, if you learn to question what you're doing as you go, you get a better result, you get a better um, uh, experience. And then as a result, I think you get better growth in your practice because people talk. So I wanna show you my first Acceladine case which goes back a number of years. Uh, this is a, a guy who came to me who worked at the UN. Uh, he had uh, moderate crowding, nothing crazy. And we created a, a clin check for him through the Invisalign software at the time. It's about 2013 when we did this. And uh, you can see, hopefully, that the teeth are kind of uh, aligning, you know, and uh, I know that with the go-to seminar, sometimes the, the, the videos don't play really nicely, so I'll give it a second to catch up. But what was important to understand here was this was a combination of clear tray attachments and IPR. So nothing crazy. But I added an accelerant because, in, you know, this guy was moving. I didn't know exactly when, but he came to my practice and he said to me, he goes, I work for the UN. They're going to be uh, relocating me at some point in the next year. I don't know when, so I need to be done quickly. So I said, okay, well, you know, at the time, all my trays were two weeks apiece. So this is how he showed up when he walked in the door. And you can see that um, we had just placed his attachments to say this is the day that he started. You can see some mild crowding on the lower. You can see number eight is rotated in a clockwise direction on the upper. So at stage 20, we took some records, okay? And at the time, the only way that I can tell you if you're really doing well or not was to look at stage 20 in not only in vivo, but to then take these pictures and compare them to the, the ClinCheck. So I thought, you know, when I put these side by side, I took a screenshot, I thought, you know, this looks pretty reasonable. This uh, photo looks a lot like what I would expect to see in the ClinCheck. The lower arch looked pretty reasonable. Again, he was 20 aligners in. So unbeknownst to me, <clears throat> he kept coming in and asking for aligners, and I didn't quite understand what he was doing. But, um, you know, we had, you know, given him the Accelidant device, um, and what we had asked him to do was to change his aligners every 10 days. And after a couple of weeks, he's like, you know, these things really fit well. So then he went to seven days. Then he went to five days. And ultimately, this guy went to three days. So this guy was like cruising through his aligners by the end. So the images on the left show you his anterior view, both before and after treatment, uh, both, both uh, in the ClinCheck view as well as in his photography. And the image on the right will show you what we achieved um, after 28 aligners on the right. And I would have to say that, you know, no refinement, 
case hit on the first shot looked really good and this guy was incredibly pleased so i was like so i was like wow like it, this was this was the case that made me believe in my own practice that acceleration not only is possible but it worked and this is what he looked like after 146 days so the thing that i find funny here is you know we talk about orthodontics in terms of years sometimes we talk about orthodontics in terms of months when we accelerate people we talk in terms of days because sometimes we can get cases done quickly and the cases i'm going to show today hopefully will show just that second case i want to show you is a non-accelerated case so this is a kid that i have through the craniofacial center he's in my practice he's got an underbite his hygiene's not so good um, he has a Baja hearing aid that's anchored to the back of his occipital with a magnetic implant that sometimes he wears and sometimes he doesn't. His mom complains that he loses these things and they're a couple thousand dollars a piece. So I was a little reticent to suggest Invisalign, but I didn't think he was going to be a good fixed candidate. So we had talked and ultimately decided to put him in Invisalign. Now, they don't want to have jaw surgery. So what we had talked about was to, was to go in here take out a single tooth because he was class class three more on the right than the left and we were going to try and jump his cross by by closing an extraction site so my treatment plan for this kid was uh invisalign appliance system extracting tooth number 28 class three elastics and i did not use acceleration because they are on a budget and they didn't want to make any more costs um, than what they had to so I'm, so I'm showing you this case because the year I started and was in 2015, if you look at the note in the purple, it says, I am not finished with this case yet. So this is how he started. This is his Cephex, right? Here's his Panorex. Nothing crazy. So his initial malocclusion changed pretty nicely within two years. So two years and one month, I take full records on him. You can see he's got a little bit more of an open bite because the extraction site isn't closing cleanly. And you can see I've added buttons. He's wearing an interarch versus class three elastics, which he's also wearing. So he's got all kinds of rubber bands that he sometimes wears, sometimes doesn't wear. His midlines look good. He's edge to edge, but uh, I've got a long way to go. Now I took records two years later. Here's the records uh, four years and three months into the case. Space is a little bit more closed. My open bite's a little bit closed, but unfortunately, I'm still edge to edge and he's not changing a lot. So I show you this case, not as a failure, <clears throat> but as an educational point. This is a non-accelerated case and I'm struggling with it. I don't know what else to do. I can't put this stuff on his teeth, but I'm, I'm, I'm very cognitively watching him and we're trying to do the best that we can. So what are the chances? I have another case, very similar, that's accelerated. So here's a 23-year-old case. He's already been treated. He's uh, showing up to my practice. I'm the third orthodontist that he's talking to. You can see the bonded wires in his, in his images here. And he's starting to chip his teeth and he's really uncomfortable. You can see there's root resorption on tooth number 29 as well. Here's the Cephex, right? Showing that he's truly edge to edge. And I had decided to do a Nitai palate expander. I don't know if you've ever seen these before. They're, uh, I get mine from Henry Schein. Um, but it's, it because I thought the hardest thing for me to treat here wasn't the class three, it was actually the transverse issue because he's kind of in a uh, edge to edge cross bite bilaterally in the posterior. So I took, and did something that you may not agree with, but I believe now, based on the way um, technology is and clear liner therapy is, that my goal is to be done just as fast as possible. And I now believe that I'm going to do whatever is appropriate for the patient, and I'm not going to make the patient fit the appliance. The previous case I showed you where the kid's in treatment for four years and he's unsuccessfully closing the extraction site, that's making the kid fit the appliance. In this case, I put an expander on the top, I put braces on the lower, they're self-ligating, I extracted tooth number 28, and I went into braces for 100 days. That's just about three months. After the three-month mark, I took all the hard, hardware off, including the expander, I built him immediate aligners, 
And at that point, I took records and I went in to design a clear aligner case. Again, I've got teeth that need to be closed in a parallel fashion. I'm trying to make sure that the torque on the teeth is appropriate. Here's a Panorex showing you what he looked like at the time that um, uh, we took the records for the clear aligner system. And now I'm using an updated clear aligner. I'm using the Clarity system from 3M. I'm not using Invisalign on this case because the tray is longer and the plastic's a little stiffer. And I need that in order to control the extraction site as I close the teeth together. So here's the AP CEF taken out of my cone beam. The image on the left shows you an edge to edge bite. The image on the right actually shows you transverse expansion on the posterior teeth. So there's no question that the NPE that I had in for 100 days actually widened the upper teeth. And because of the way um, they're built, they have, a, they have a lot of palatal root torque. So as the teeth expand, they tend to push the palatal cusp up, not out, because of the torque. And uh, if you insert these properly, you don't, you don't create an open bite, which is what I was shooting for. So now I designed a clear aligner system that I thought would be more effective for closing the extraction site and improving the bite. And uh, this is the setup that I achieved. Uh, and I'm going to show you back the malocclusion image here in a moment. But you'll see uh, the top center image shows you that the midline on the lower teeth is slightly to the right. And the issue that I had was when he was starting, the midline was about two and a half to three millimeters to the left. So at stage 18, we took some diagnostic records on him to see where we were at. One of the interesting pieces of the Clarity Aligner System from 3M is that you do this thing called the progress check, and it grades every single tooth in six different ways within two minutes. It's a web-based uh, tool that's uh, artificially intelligence-based, and what it does is it lines the models up with the best fit, shows you a pictorial image that you can see here, and then you can judge for yourself how you're doing. So cosmetically, he looks fine. He doesn't look bad at all. When you look at these progress scans, then this is what it looks like. So the blue circle on the timeline down below shows you that the blue teeth are the actual malocclusion. Underneath the blue circle is a hollow white circle, and that would be stage 18 in the treatment design software. So when I look at the extraction site on the lower right, the extraction site is actually in really good control. So I was really pleased with what I saw. Unfortunately, when I looked at the lower left, I saw that the teeth were actually narrower than the design, which in, um, you know, in the other large clear aligner system, you learn to over-engineer your cases. But in a situation like this, where you're using a longer, stiffer tray, you actually don't over-engineer. You just engineer to be right on. So I decided at this point to take my scan and just refine it or build it forward. So... I, I'm not going to let the appliance dictate how my case is going. I'm actually going to make my appliance work for me. So I don't believe in pushing bad plastic. So at this point, I thought it was prudent to go ahead and build the case forward. So this is the table I talked about that tells you how every tooth is doing. Um, it, it comes for both the maxillary as well as the mandibular. This image obviously is the lower teeth. And you can kind of see um, it talks in terms of black, orange, and red. Black meaning the tooth is 0 to 15% from, from plan. Uh, orange is 15 to 29%, and red is actually 30% or more off from the plan. So the only numbers I look at are the red numbers, and I don't even pay attention to a number if it's less than 5 or 6. Interestingly, on the, on the lower molars, you can see a 13.9 right underneath the request refinement. That would be the mesial distal translation and the buccal lingual inclination. So 13.9 there is the buccal lingual inclination. So for me, I thought that these, these teeth were just beyond 30% off my treatment design, so it was time to refine it. So I built a new plan. Hopefully this video will kind of come through a little bit, and you can kind of see how the teeth were kind of coming back. I, I know I'm not going to have a perfect occlusion on the right side. That's a planned uh, position for me. I'm creating... Uh, over jet and somewhat overbite, I guess, but I'm taking him out of an edge to edge position, which is turning out to be a damaging position for him. You can see on the left side here, he's full class one. So I then went forward with my refinement. I got into I got into uh, my next my next progress scan, which was stage number twenty four. My numbers look good, so I just 
kept the case running. You can see the extraction site is still closing nicely. That's what he looks like. He's pretty close to what my treatment design is predicting. So this is what he looked like at month number 10. This is what he looks like at month number 12. This is what he looked like at his fifth progress scan, which is at aligner number 38. So for my purposes, I really felt he tracked pretty good. If you looked at numbers on the bottom of this table here, he wasn't bad. Cosmetically, I need to do a little more uprighting of the lower incisors, and I need to round out the arch a little bit more. So I went ahead then and built 10 final trays, which he's currently in the middle of doing right now. He's uh, I actually just saw him on Monday. He's on stage number 43 right now, 43 of 48. Everything's fitting perfect. And I'm tracking him to be done in 19 months and two weeks. So here's, here's the question I'm going to ask you in no blunt terms. Bilateral crossbite, midline deviation to the left three millimeters, anterior edge to edge. I took out a tooth. I moved the midline to the right. I established overbite. I established overjet. And I closed an extraction site in a controlled manner with parallel roots in 19 months with aligners. When was the last time you did that? Do you know what I mean? Like, this shouldn't happen, and yet it does. So there is something to be said for the accelerant, for the vibration here. I can't tell you exactly how it works, other than I know the science of it. All I can tell you is, anecdotally, we've been using them for a number of years, and this is a, this is a system that we see pretty often. Here's another case I want to show you. This is an 18-year-old, and, and this is a case where I didn't do the initial orthodontics, but the case is now class three subdivision right, and um, he's leaving to go to college at the end of this year. So let me show you some photos. The image on the top left represents him before he does a phase one. He's in an underbite, anterior underbite. The image in the middle is called the conclusion of phase one. Again, not my records. The other practice was kind enough to let me have these images. Image on the lower right is the conclusion of phase two. Now, if these if these are correct, they struggled a little bit with the with the conclusion of phase one. And if you look at his face, you'll see his chin is never symmetrically in the middle. The closest that his chin looks to be in symmetrical is is the bottom right where he's in the, like the pale green aqua colored t-shirt. But at the end of the day, he still has a little asymmetry. So he shows up in our practice, January of 2018, midline deviation, chin significantly to the left, anterior open bite. And the mom says, I don't want to do jaw surgery. What can we do to fix this bite? So in five, in almost four, four years, I guess, approximately four years, he started to grow out of his correction, and they're trying to be proactive, but they also know that he's leaving for college in, in August, actually on the 14th of August, 2018, he's going to go to Michigan. So I talked it through with them, and I said, your, your toughest problem for me is going to be probably the transverse issue, the, the crossbite of your back teeth. I, I said the midline deviation is secondary to me. They don't want to have jaw surgery, and they don't want to pull teeth. So what I opted to do was, again, I jumped his crossbite first with a Hyrax. He's 18 years old. I believe that you can get suture, suture opening and, and orthopedic expansion on, a, on an 18-year-old. Now, not every 18-year-old will pop, but I think it's worth trying. And then I would go in with uh, class 3 elastics and a clear aligner system to correct his bite. So we went ahead, we put the expander in, and sure enough, we got a nice pop on the, on the suture. You can see the gap between his front teeth. And uh, this kid was all in. He was doing four turns a day. Then he, I slowed him down to two turns a day because I didn't want to you know, hurt him or anything. But he was, he was definitely a um, willing participant, if you will. So on February 26th of 2018, this is what he looked like. So I figured I had to wait a couple weeks to let things calm down. So I, I call him back April 2nd to take the expander out. On April 2nd, he looks like this. 
So at this point, we took the expander out. We took full records to make a clear aligner system. But he's in a he's got a lot of stuff going on at school. He's got a judo tournament. He's he's wrapping up. He's got homecoming. So I don't even get a chance to work on him until May. So I built him a clear tray upper and said you need to wear this full time, which he did. So my plan actually started on May 21st of that year to align his teeth. Now, from an alignment standpoint, I only built him 16 trays. And again, I used the, the system from 3M to do this because uh, I wanted a really stiff tray to be able to control the teeth and hold the torque really in a specific position. So my protocol was I started the first three trays for about two weeks apiece because I had warmed the teeth up. Uh, he got an accelerant from day one, and then uh, we cut his cycles from from two weeks to almost five days, right, right, right from the go. We, you know, and then uh, eventually at the end he was going to a, a three-day cycle again, which I don't like doing. But he was leaving August 14th for college, and I didn't want to leave him in a position where he wasn't finished. I was trying to see how stable I can get him. So I want to show you just how he progressed through the through the summer with me. This was him June 26th. Um, he's still a little class, he's definitely a little class three on the right. Uh, his midline's off a little bit, but his bite is starting to settle down. This was him on July 2nd. Um, the, he's getting some contact on the teeth. On the right side, he's still a little open on the left. This is him July 16th. The front teeth are starting to touch a little bit. His chin is still a little asymmetrical, but his midlines are pretty close. Um, but he's starting to get his contact back. I, I was sweating it at this point, thinking like, okay, dude, you got to wear double rubber bands for me. We really got to make sure these class threes are doing their job. And this is where I got him. On, on August 14th, you can see my bottom image here. This looks pretty good. His midline's off a little bit, but I got him in really relatively speaking, out of crossbite and closed down. And he definitely wasn't in an edge-to-edge -edge bite. Now, I didn't believe that he would be stable. So at this point, he came into my office and we bonded upper and lower fixed retainers. We made clear aligners on top of them. I asked him to continue to wear the retainers full time. And I put hooks on the retainers for him to wear a class two, class three elastic. Um, and as a result of that, uh, he was pretty close to what I had predicted that he would, that what he would look like. So I was really pretty pleased with this and, and they were tickled and he showed up over Thanksgiving to see me and he was stable. So I don't know how we'll do in the long run. This will be a good case to kind of watch in the long run, but I'm, I'm still thinking like he needs to wear the rubber bands on his retainers as he goes to sleep at night which is hard to convince a college kid to do, but that was my request. Here's another kid that we watched that we've known for a long time now. And if you see him, so he was in an underbite. I got him out of the out of the edge to edge bite into an overbite. And he, not a bad, you know, it took us a year to get there. He had a face mask. Then he grew again, grew out of his result again. And then I, you know, at this point I lost track of him. And he shows up on my doorstep uh, last year in the summer, and he looks like this. So now Danny is six foot three. He's a big kid now. He um, midlines around, but he's in a full underbite. So the mom and dad I've known for a long time now. He had a brother that had no aberrant growth whatsoever, and the um, you know, the underbite here was pretty extreme and his lower teeth are kind of canted inwards. So, so, you know, I said, you know, well, your options are, you know, wait till he comes home because he's in school in Canada. And they're like, no, that's not really an option because he um, he's in agriculture and he may go. So he's in the northern provinces of Canada and I uh, may do like a Greenpeace thing afterwards. But he's he his specialty is. Uh, improving the efficiency of, of growth of rice. So he's so he may be traveling a lot after school. So so they really want to kind of get the jaw surgery done during the course of college. So I didn't know what to do. So I said, you know, I can't manage fixed hardware, you know, every six months. It doesn't make sense. I said, 
maybe I can put him in a clear liner system. Uh, and then after the he's in the clear liner system, he can come home. I can put braces on him, put him through surgery, and uh, you know we can see how it goes. So so I took records on him, and I decided I was my treatment plan would be that I was going to decompensate him with clear aligners uh, using class three elastics and uh, or class actually class two elastics to make him worse, and then uh, we would put a buckle appliance on uh, for just for the surgery, and then we would switch to a class two or a class three, depending, uh, after surgery for the final midline DV details and stuff like that. So I figured if I had him home for a couple of months in the summer of 2019, I can get my surgical work done. Uh, and I thought like, you know, this may work out. So I actually built him, we saw him in August and we took records. He wasn't home until December. So these are the records from August of 2018. That's his underbite. So I put him in software. This is the treatment designer from 3M, from the Clarity Aligner system. And the software actually made the underbite less, which was absolutely the wrong thing to do. I, I needed to tell the software to make him worse, not better. So I couldn't accept that. So we went through a couple setups. We finally got the teeth set up. We were able to build a total of 15 aligners. I sent him to college with all 15 aligners once we put the attachments on. He came in uh, in the spring of 2019. You can see this is April 30th, 2019. This is his progress scan and his numbers are actually pretty good. So he was using his Excelident um, daily. He uh, was going through his trays, not at a blistering pace, at, you know, about a one week per tray. And when he came home, we just had to make sure that the teeth were represented properly based on the treatment design that we had planned. So the progress scan allowed me to understand just exactly that, that the teeth were in position. Once the teeth were in position, I put a full set of clarity brackets on, and these are passive uh, 1925 stainless steel wires that are posted, sent them through uh, my department for surgery at the University of Illinois. And about three weeks later, I took his records, and this is what he looks like. So this is 21 days post-op. Uh, I'd just taken his braces back off, and right after I took his braces off, I took full records again to make uh, all the aligners to detail his midline now. So when I was debanding him, uh, I figured I was going to wear a class 2, class 3 elastic. So I'd opted to actually put some ceramic hooks on him. I actually took one of the central incisors that, that when the brackets come off, they collapse on a, on the, there's a score on the midline, they break in half. So I, I took one of the central, maxillary central incisors, I sandblasted it. Um, and then I rebonded it with a porcelain primer. I rebonded it onto the upper left canine and the lower right canine so we could wear a class two elastic on the left and the class three elastic on the right with his future aligners that I was designing uh, for final midline correction. So this is what he looked like uh, at the point three weeks out of surgery when I was designing the final aligners for his midline. So this is the treatment design that shows a little bit of IPR and final tooth movement to get everything uh, lined up and in place. He's gonna continue wearing his Excelident for this. And I'm hoping that this is the result I'm gonna see when he shows back up from Canada in December of this year, because that's the next time he's home. So I think um, managing a case surgically, you know, using an aligner is an edgy topic this case went really well for me. I'm kind of a believer that if I've got a cooperative uh, patient, that this is really maybe a, a nice option. Here's another case that walked in my door, May 15th of this year. She was sent over by a periodontist because she's got a biological width infraction on teeth 7 through 10. Somebody had cemented crowns on her and left no room between the edge of the porcelain and the bone, and she's just irritated and bleeding and uncomfortable and uh, not very happy. Now, the part that makes this case a little twisted, she's getting married in August, and uh, if you do the math quickly here, you, you're going to realize that that's not a lot of time between August 3rd and May 15th. So my, my treatment plan here is a little out of the box, okay? 
because she's class two and because she's got a hundred percent overbite, I'm trying to mitigate the damages here as fast as possible. And she's going to have crown lengthening like the week after I, I met her. And she's going to have provisional crowns placed. So the question is, what could I do, practically speaking, to improve matters before the wedding? And then what will I do after the wedding to stabilize the occlusion? So my treatment mechanics were to put her actually in braces uh, the exact amount of time was 73 days, which I know sounds weird when you talk days, not months. And you'll see how I did. And she had an accelerant. So, so this is how she presented to the to the practice when we first met her. 100% overbite. She got provisionalized. We gave her uh, Clarity Ultra, which is a self-ligating ceramic bracket. And we're going to take ultimately the ultra off and we're going to switch to the clarity uh, aesthetic aligner system to wrap up her mechanics, whatever she needs once we take the braces off. So this is the area where the infraction is. This is the amount of overjet you can see through the original Ceph X-ray. So after 33 days, I took some photos. I don't think you can really bring her in much sooner than that because it's kind of like watching paint dry. Um, but we've got her bite open a little bit using some composite on the molars. Um, we've got some uh, copper nickel titanium wires in there, hopefully kind of gently moving the teeth into position. The top teeth, when they did the crown lengthening, they kind of decorticated all the bone around the front six teeth. So I'm expecting these top teeth to be nicely adept at moving for my purposes. And um, as a rule, I would say that we made her teeth a little bit longer when we did the crown lengthening. So she'll lose some of the gumminess in her smile, which was one of our chief objectives. So it's 77 days. Okay, so I thought it was 73 days. 77 days total, we took everything off. And this is how she went back to the prosthodontist for uh, polishing of the provisionals, a profi, and stuff like that. Uh, the, very, the very next day after we debonded all our hardware, at this point, we took the records to build the clear trays for her. And again, I'm using the Clarity Aligner System from 3M. And in addition to that, we built her clear trays to stay to hold her in position. Now, the part that you have to appreciate is the overbite change. That's a real change. Her teeth are in occlusion at this point. And that's a nice change in the, over, in the overbite. So we took her braces off. The overjet was reduced by 3.5 millimeters, which was a significant amount of change for two months. The biological width infraction was corrected. The provisionals, for my purposes, worked fine. And most importantly, if you look at the lingual side of tooth number 27, this case now can be treated with clear aligners because you can see the lingual of tooth number 27. But when she, when she was starting initially, due to the position of teeth number 25 and 26, the only way you could have really done a clear aligner system here is if you would have done some very slow expansion or done a lot of IPR, neither of which I had time for, nor did I want to do. So I think, it sounds weird, but starting her in braces for a short period of time is a hybrid concept. It just worked well for her. It's a picture of her at the wedding. And the image on the left shows you um, what I kind of designed in terms of treatment for her in terms of um, tooth movement. Just really quickly, you know, so you have a lot of choices here when it comes to acceleration, you know. There's a lot of ways to make the case go. The easiest, simplest thing that you can lay onto any case is to buy a vibration device. It just works. So again, you know, is this a predictable concept? This case happens to be an Invisalign. Is this a predictable concept? Class two deep bite. Here she is two years into it, midline's on, canine's class one, just kind of detailing out the teeth at this point. Does she look good? Yeah, she looks really good. You know, and you really look at the difference in the bite between her smile, her smile's broader, her overbite's improved, her cuspid guidance is almost established at this point. 
and this is an Acceladine case. So it, I, I'm of the belief if you if you want to make your life simple, I just think almost all your clear aligner cases should be accelerated, at least at the vibration level, because it just makes sense, especially if they're a non-grower. Here's another case. This one's a little different. This is an anterior open bite with a narrow buckle segment. Again, does this make sense to do clear aligner wise? Well, you know, they tell you no. Does it work? Yeah, it does work. You know, here he is 22 months in. He's waiting right now for a refinement where we're going to now extrude the teeth and put them into contact, uh, in, intrude the posteriors and extrude the anteriors like a teeter totter. So, you know, does this really work? Yep, this works. You can see he shows more teeth now. He's completely thrilled with his results. So, from my end, I just want to show you one braces case, okay, really quickly. You know, we all get cases like this. This is a really tough open bite, crowded case. Look at the perio issues on the lower incisors. This is a tough case. Here she is 14 months into treatment. You won't see a lot of hardware in the top because she's got lingual braces on the top. She's got incognito on the top, and she's got clarity advanced flash free on the lower. You can see my midlines are under control. That's the 14-month mark. Here she is at the 22 month mark. We're just closing extraction sites right now. And you can appreciate the fact that she's really in good control. So the image on the right shows you the original male. The image in the middle shows you the 14 month progress picture. The image on the left shows you the 22 month progress picture. Really nicely controlled mechanics. Here it is on the lower. Same thing, image on the right is the initial, 14 months in the middle, 22 months on the left. And the best part about the whole case is look at the blue circle and look how the soft tissue is responding. Root got pushed back into the bone, soft tissue bounced back. You can't make this stuff up. If you design plastic properly, it's a useful tool. Does it make sense to do stuff to augment your mechanics? A thousand percent. I do it all day long. Every case, if I can augment a case, I do. She's happy, and you can be happy too, simply by adding Excel in it. So I think if you're trying to set yourself apart from other practices, try something new. Because as we learned from my favorite movie, The Lion King, change is hard, but if you're going to be relevant, it's a requirement to make your practice grow. And you can see my puppy, Teddy, here chewing on my aligner because she pulled it off my dinner table because she was a bad puppy that day. All right, so hopefully I've got about 10 minutes here to answer some questions. The moderator is going to come back on, Mally, right? That's right. I am right here. I wanted to thank you for such a, a really interesting and informative uh, presentation. Um, we have some questions, um, but before I get to the questions, I want, again, to ask our viewers to use the question box in the control panel to ask any questions that you may have. Um, first question I have, um, in which cases or specific movements would you recommend Excel Dent? Is there, are there any specific ones? So again, you know, I, I kind of I look at when I'm going to accelerate a case, I look at three things. Uh, one is, you know, the financial feasibility of a patient. The second is the periodontal situation. And then most importantly, what kind of mechanics I'm using. So I really like using vibration on all clear aligner cases. I don't necessarily see it as, as a possibility unless you're willing to financially cut cut the cost of your aligner case so that, because if people see your fee and they're like, I don't want to spend another $300, $400, we sell ours for around $325. So, but I don't want to give it to somebody because from my end, every time I gave somebody uh, an acceleration device, they didn't really use it. So I think the value of something for nothing is nothing. So I, for cases that have rotations of greater than 30 degrees, cases that are moderately to severe crowded that need to be advanced, cases that need to have transverse dim dimensional um, expansion, these are all cases I think vibration makes a lot of sense. Okay, a uh, question that just came in. Do you use Excelident in adult aligner treatment regularly? Yeah, oh, for sure we do. For sure we do. You know, and we use we use a lot of stuff in our practice. You know, we have we have everything that you can imagine, you know, from surgery down to, 
custom made braces and anything in between. So, you know, in my world, the way we describe our practice is we are a large uh, boutique practice. So meaning uh, we may have volume and we have a bunch of chairs, but at the end of the day, I believe that customized care for each individual patient will provide good results in a shorter period of time and that lets both the practice and the patient win. So I think it makes a lot of sense to introduce it to your practice. Really, the only thing that hurts about this thing is there's a cost. Beyond that, you can't say anything bad to it. There's, there's enough studies out there that even if someone says, you know, oh, I think this study is, is, is not done well, there's enough studies out there that show that this stuff works at this point that, again, if you believe it's going to work, it's going to work. But if you don't believe it's going to work, then don't introduce it to your practice. Why would I introduce anything to my practice that's anything less than successful? It makes no sense. Not at our size and our level. We've never been sued. We're a large practice. You know, we see 1,600 new patients a year. But, but we get some really, really, really hard stuff. And, and I think that Excelident is one of the first things we, you know, I, six years ago I learned. Like, I, I showed you the case that taught me. Like, I was like, I was dumbfounded. I'm like, this shouldn't work, but it did. You know, I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't understand how a plane flies, but I get on one like two to three times a month and I don't think twice about it. So I just don't think twice about adding acceleration now. Okay, I have two questions that are similar, so I'm going to put them together. I'm going to combine them. Um, the one question is, what is your regular aligner change protocol with Excelident? Is it three to five days? And then my next question is, somebody else asked, during a treatment, do you change the aligner wear time? What I mean is 10 days for complex movements in the posterior area versus, let's say, three days of minor, less complex movements in the social six. So yeah. I think both questions are about timing. Right. So, um, all right, so to answer your question, generally speaking, the rhythm that I believe all cases should go to is my first three to four trays or two weeks, simply because histologically speaking, your teeth can't move. You can tell me anything you want, your teeth can't move, and if you move your teeth, you're going to hyalinize the periodontal ligament. I've got a master's in histo. I'll go up against you any day of the week and, and prove you wrong if you say anything less than that. What you can do if you just want to do one week trays is you can request that you get half the velocity that your tooth movement's going to be for your first three to four trays. And if you do that, I think it makes a lot of sense then to say, okay, we're just one week trays on everybody. When we're in a hurry, we go down to five days. When we're in a super hurry, we go down to three days. But uh, so anecdotally, if I'm doing a three day turn, I request the acceleration device be used twice a day. Do you have to change any other treatment strategies when you use Excelident? Well, you know, one of the big ones is financial because, you know, as you saw, like I, I like the kid going to Michigan, he had trays for three months. Like, how do you, how do, you do a whole treatment fee for three months? You know, he, he had an expander first, but the actual clear liner, you know, did a good job over three months. And, and I tell people like, you know, when we deliver your retainers, I'm like, I'm not off the hook. I'm, I'm, I'm still working for you. I'm still monitoring you. I'm still making sure that you're not collapsing, falling off, relapsing, whatever you want to call it. So I think you got to be careful about how you price stuff. Um, you know, I think one of the hot, hot new uh, horizons is going to be in-house aligner therapy. And uh, I think there is a tremendous number of cases that are just a soft relapse, you know, that people would normally not do anything about that are probably sitting in your waiting room that are going to become future cases for you. And uh, I'm, I'm picking people out of the waiting room now and I'm having conversations with them about their children and I'm pulling them into my practice now by doing in-house aligner therapy. And, you know, and now we're, we're starting to, to, to say, okay, you know, you just need a couple trays. And that's, I think, one of the greatest growth factor areas coming right now is to be able to turn people around quickly. So even in our clear aligner therapy cases, you know, we're meeting you today. We have the ability to give you your first three or four trays today or tomorrow morning. And then we'll send the rest out to Invisalign or 3M to get built, you know, so, um, I think there's a lot of really good promise here. And the one thing that has to happen is trays must be efficient. They must fit well. So for my purposes, I think these, 
I think like you're going to see a lot of the, because I, I don't care what anybody says, a clear, a clear tray works, but it's not as efficient as a fixed appliance. It just isn't, you know, you're, you're selling a part of your soul here when you go removable, because if they take it off, it stops working. So as a result of that, I think acceleration is, is going to be kind of more the norm, not the occasion in the future. And as these devices get more popular, maybe a little cheaper or whatever, I think what you'll see is they'll just become part of your package. You know, and I'm like, look, I, I didn't come here to do an okay job. I came here to knock it out of the park. Anything that I can do to make the tray move your teeth easier, set your teeth up better, give you a more stable result, that that is my job for you. You commissioned me to do the very best thing that I can for you to give you the best result, both in stability and as well as in terms of aesthetics. And if and if that means that all our cases have have removable uh, vibration devices, then I think that's outstanding. You know, because it's it's just money. I mean, and I don't want to sound crass about it, but if it makes the case more effective, then it should be a part of your treatment plan. If someone's on a budget, I understand that, but you know, if they come to you and they say, I, I want you to give me your best result, it's just in the conversation. Every si it's always in the conversation. And interestingly, you may not agree with this, but we always separate it in our fee structure so people understand that there's a cost to it and that we lose money. We are investing in the patient and we sell this hard. So I'm investing in you, I believe in you, and because I believe and invest in you, we're gonna be a team. We're going to do this together. And and people accept buying something when they know that I'm investing in them and giving them something where I'm losing money. It doesn't make business sense, but it does because the whole case finishes faster and I still get the same fee or or potentially more money because, you know, it's like we have an expedite fee and we, we sell things at a premium. Uh, which leads to my next question, which is uh, what have the patients report, reported back about the com when you combine the liner therapy and Acceladip? Uh, nothing but nice things to say. People are surprised at how easy it is. Like they're shocked. You know, the other thing too, like, you know, we use uh, a lot of technology in our practice and every chair has a computer. We have Dolphin on every single chair. We have a website that allows them to log in and see every single photo and x-ray we've ever shot. Uh, their referral doctor can see every single photo and x-ray and download them in their practice as well. So, you know, we we make people literally not just understand what we're doing, we, we want them to see it. We want them to take pictures with their cell phones. We want them to share the information with other people. We want them to talk about it. I think that the thing that we don't talk about a lot is patient engagement, the ability to talk to patients, the ability to have a, 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 a conversation with them, not when they're in the chair, but when they're out of the office. So whether, whether you, you, know, you have a system kind of needling them a little bit or you're reaching out to them randomly or you're, you know, you're just giving someone a Starbucks card because you made them wait a couple minutes and it was just a nice thing to do or you have some type of reward system, Anything that you can do to make the experience better is always good. This concept makes pain go away and cases go faster. Uh, what was that slide I showed at the beginning? Like 85, 89% of people want to be done faster. It's, you know, cost looks, comfort, speed, lifestyle. There's five things to dictate what the patient will request, literally. And if, and if speed and comfort are high, they're two of the five things, and you can knock them both out in, in, a, in a device simply by giving it to them that they pay for, for the most part, and do themselves, you look like you're a brainiac, you know what I mean? You can only look like a good doctor. So I think it's, again, you know, I really sell the whole conversation about this is a team effort. We're trying to, to work together with you. And because of that, we get them involved, and I think patients that are involved have a better experience. Patients that are involved talk more. Patients that talk send other patients to you. I mean, we're we're not at a loss for new patients ever, you know. And I think it's partly because of maybe it's our personality, maybe it's how we interact with people. But at the end of the day, I think it's all good. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, wow, that's a very informative. Um, we've run out of time today, but um, and thank everyone for your questions. 
Um, if we did not get to your question, it will be answered after the webinar via email. Um, but I want to thank you again all for attending, and a special thank you for a wonderful presentation to Dr. Warshawski and to our sponsor for this webinar, OrthoXL. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.